Hello and welcome to Switzer TV Investing. I'm Peter Switzer and we go out every Monday night. So go to Switzer Financial Group and YouTube and become a subscriber and press the like button. And tonight, of course, it's all coronavirus. How serious is this? Can markets recover? And should you cash out and just run for the sidelines? Now, joining me first is Charlie Aitken, a fund manager from Aitken Investment Management, and Paul Rickard from the Switzer Report. Now, these guys, surprisingly, are relaxed about the coronavirus. Nervous, but relaxed. And then the old debating enemies, Professor Dr. Doom, Steve Keen, and the smartest guy in the room, Chris Joy of Coolabar Capital. I talked to them individually about how they're seeing this coronavirus. Let's start with Charlie and Paul and just how scared you should be about the coronavirus. To catch up with what Paul Rickard from the Switzer Report and Charlie Aiken from Aiken Investment Management is thinking about the coronavirus's impact on both the markets and even the economy, we're catching up with those guys right now. Charlie, what do you reckon? Well, I'm thinking more about the monetary policy and fiscal policy response to coronavirus now. I think that's where you need to start thinking. I think you're on the verge of a coordinated central bank uh, rate cutting moment, mm. which is probably helps markets in the short term, or at least stops the doom loop, mm -hmm. the negative feedback doom loop. So you'll get a little bit of central bank action, I think, this week, including the Reserve Bank tomorrow. But I'm also thinking about where targeted fiscal uh, stimulus will come. So yes, we're all aware of why we're here. I'm trying to work out what happens from here. Mm. So look, I've, I think there's, it's a highly interesting moment in markets, but it could be the same playbook as every other correction in the last uh, five or ten years. Paul, for people who haven't worked out why the market is so spooked, explain the link between coronavirus and the fact that stock prices have to fall. Well, I think there are two links, Peter. First of all, that um, we have so much of the supply chain which is uh, integrated globally. So one manufacturer who needs to make products can't needs a particular component. It comes out of China or it comes out of a, an area that's uh, uh, has, has issues with the virus so that things can't get made, so it actually can't produce its goods, therefore it can't get the sale, its revenue falls, has to think about the cost base it has, it looks at its own sort of number of staff and so forth, and you get into that cycle of, of companies having to look at their, you know, reduced spending because yeah. they can't generate the sales. So that's probably the, 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 biggest, uh, the biggest linkage. So it is actually a view that as what that'll do, is cause the economy, economic activity to slow down. Yeah, yeah. That only means lower profits, lower earnings, impacts to what shareholders get and markets come off. And yeah, I yeah. think you've got to remember too, we're coming off, it was only, what, 10 days ago, yeah. we're at all time highs. Yeah. So when you're at all time highs, and you had a great run up, there are lots of profits. To get a sharp pullback is not, not out yeah. of the ordinary. I think the other thing is it's about, you know, what changed last week? So what went from the market not really worrying about this to the market panicking about it? Well, it, it was actually getting better in China, and the data continues to get better in China on coronavirus. There's no doubt about that. Mm. People are starting to return to work. Even Apple's supply chain is getting back up and running, and Starbucks are opening their stores. So that's actually happening. Yeah. But what happened? It's obviously started to spread mm. outside of China. Yeah. South and, Korea and, and Italy. Like we had said, in, I think we said this two weeks ago here, if the New York subway system starts yep. to get shut down, they will worry in America. Mm. Well, it wasn't the New York subway system, but it found its way to America. Yeah. So to me, it's just about the spread of this thing and the duration. How long will this interruption go on for? But we are starting to see a coordinated response. I will say that again. And one of the reasons the Dow intraday reversed on Friday night from a 4% loss to pretty much flat was that Fed Chairman Jay Powell said they're ready to act. Mm -hmm. The markets needed that. They needed the intervention to stop, as I say, the doom loop. Yeah, and what BOA, that? Bank of America, said the first one might even be a half a percent. And yeah, they I like don't think that they'll do well. that. I, think I, think I don't think so either, but I, they did say it's a chance. It's, it's just, you need some stability in these mm. moments, yeah. because if you start to get you know all, all sorts of confidence loops going the wrong way, don't get me wrong, this is a scary situation in terms of the virus. It's mm. quite easy. I do understand why people are running out and buying toilet paper and this sort of stuff. Mm. I, don't, I get it, right? But as an investor, I've got to calmly work my way through this and work out where I want to be in three months, six months, nine months, when it's probable that we are not talking about coronavirus. Yeah. Is it the worst virus markets have had to face, apart from the Spanish flu? 
Look, it's probably not the worst virus, Peter, but I think it's the worst in an era of automated trading and where, oh, um, yeah. you know, so much of what happens in our markets and on a day-by-day basis is, is, I won't say computers, but well, computer programs yeah. automatically Software. selling a whole lot of portfolios and buying portfolios the minute various it triggers It ramps up the momentum and, and, and that's why you yeah. can get, you know, sudden moves of 1%, 2% in, in 30 minutes or even less. Yeah. simply because a whole lot of trading programs cut in. And every stock is impacted because they buy the book. Yeah. You know, when, they, when, when, when these, they're not just buying a couple of handful of stocks like an investor. When these computer programs are going off, they're selling portfolios and buying portfolios, so the whole market moves. Mm. I think this and, is where it gets really interesting, yeah. right? So I'm an active investor. I'm not a passive investor. I right? 20-odd mm. stocks. That's mm. it. But when you get the clearance sale in the market, this is mm. what this is, a clearance sale. Everything is down. Mm. Everything. The best stock that was it was irrespective of sector of quality yeah. of stock of anything really yeah. so inside that that's where we thank our passive friends for the opportunity because mm. they're selling everything all as one yeah. so inside that where you stock where you were for example i've kept your microsoft because you bought yeah, microsoft so low you wrote it actually, up i bought my, more microsoft i bought more apple i bought more amazon i bought more alphabet on friday yeah. as, as the mm. just a bit more not too brave mm. but just a bit more but the passive opportunity, I'm sorry to use my hands here, is taking the whole market down, mm. okay? And there's some forced selling there as well, and some liquidation of things, and computers trading against computers. But inside that, I will guarantee you there is opportunity mm. on a stock-by-stock -stock basis. And we've got to work our way through that, all of us, and find some good places to actually allocate mm. some money. Because you can rest assured that interest rates will remain low for the rest of this year, and probably the next five years, mm. And the alternative in cash will be poor. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that's what's interesting is because tomorrow if we get a quarter percent cut, who knows if they might even go half percent, question mark, hmm. depending how brave they feel. I mean, that will flow its way back into term deposits and all everything else you're getting out there. And so, you know, the so-called annuity style, interest rate sensitive stocks, they're going to look really cheap again. Yeah, you, you, know? you know what Australian yeah. banks will do. They'll lower the deposit rate by the cash rate. They'll lower the term deposit rate by the cash rate. Mm -hmm. They will not lower the mortgage rate by the amount of the cash rate change mm -hmm. to protect their margins. Mm -hmm. So the person who will get punished again is that with those with too much cash. Now, everyone with too much cash is cheering at the moment. I told you so and the markets were too yep. high. My only advice is you need to consider putting some of that cash to work in, in the best quality businesses you can find in the equity market. That's all I've, I know. Mm. Are we going to expect then dividends to keep trimming back, Paul, as interest rates keep going lower? Because Charlie said they could um, have look, five I, years. I think the outlook for dividends is a little mixed, Peter, possibly to... to uh, I, don't, I think dividends, I'm actually writing something at the moment about this, uh, Peter, will, will be just a little bit higher in 2020 than they were uh, last year. But you're right. I mean, what ultimately, if earnings are under pressure, mm. uh, there's a lot more focus. I just talk about the Australian market. I think there's mm. always been more focus in the US here. There's a lot more focus in the Australian market about sustainable payout ratios. They got too high. And we had companies like BHP with progressive policies mm. and everyone take, trying to take advantage of other changes around franking. P uh, payout ratios are under pressure generally in the Australian market. And I think if you get into an environment of, again, very, very low interest rates, the RBA cuts, economic activity slows, just makes it harder for companies to earn money. Mm. I think there's going to be pressure to maintain dividends. So the outlook for dividends is not as rosy as it was, say, 12 months ago. Yeah. I think, if anything, we might be looking back in 12 months' time and saying dividends have just come down a touch yeah. uh, versus 2000 and uh, this current 12 months. Okay, so the battle, the battle ahead then. I'll just say one thing on the dividend thing. You yeah. must also look at the balance sheet as well right, yeah. of the company. Highly geared companies in this environment are really in, in a quite a pickle, quite yeah, frankly. Yeah. So you need to look at the sustainability. Despite the, the low interest rate, they're well, in a pickle. Because you've got a sales problem too. You've got yeah. a revenue problem. Yeah, a revenue problem. You've got to pay your, pay your interest, but yep. you've got to actually get your revenue. So the one thing that you know I think is really important in this situation is to focus on the very best balance sheets you can find. Because if this gets worse, and it can get worse, don't get me wrong, it doesn't matter what I think, you, know, you want to have fortress balance sheets. You can see this through. Because it doesn't matter how low the interest rate is, if you haven't got any revenue, you've still, you've still got to service your debt. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting moment. And the other thing is I'd be a touch careful, and this is what's played out in the last month or so, buying resource stocks for yield. Yeah. I think that is a, a, a mistake. Yeah. Right? So just I'd be cautious. Yeah, because we, we have seen commodity prices fall dramatically since well, the start. And again, just go back to the actual, although everything's been sold off, the two sectors that have done worse here, or the three sectors have done worse here in the Australian market, and it's obviously a little different globally, but the Australian market are the IT companies, and that's because they yeah, just got out of a huge run. Yeah. 
Uh, and then uh, energy, everyone can talk yep. about energy, yep. we know the energy well, price. And number three are, the, are materials. So mm. BHP, Rio's and Fortescue's have lost, have been the hardest hit. Mm. Uh, and you know, iron ore prices come down as you'd expect. So the, their profits have been solely on the back of higher commodities prices. Yeah. Commodities prices come under a little bit of pressure, which they have, as you know, China cuts back a little bit or production in China just slows, which is what people are fearing. Um, resource companies here will get hit. Okay, so that brings to the next question then. If Charlie, you're right that the, the, the mega stimulation we get from fiscal and monetary results in a economic comeback, will materials, the like stocks, BHP and Rio, go up? So are they a buying opportunity? Yeah, what I'm saying is do not buy resource stocks for, for the income. Yeah, okay, but, but, do we, income. but do we no. see them as a buying opportunity well, I, I think for share price? From a trading perspective, from a trading perspective, and this is not, not an investing perspective, mm -hmm. I think beaten up large cap resource stocks and some of the energy stocks like Woodside look oversold. Mm -hmm. yeah. And could the, could the oil price bounce 10 or 15%? Absolutely. Absolutely. If, on there's, if there's a recovery. Would yeah. I, how would I approach this? I would only buy the best of the best. So if you want to buy a resource stock that covers most commodities at the low end of the cost curve, I would simply buy some BHP. Mm -hmm. And that, that's enough for me. And I think that, that if it rebounds, well, they've got yeah. great leverage to it and diversity. Because mm -hmm. you don't want to be a one trick pony. If you're just in oil, you're oil. You know, iron ore is just you know very high price as well. So, I think look, I think there is a chance of a recovery in resource stocks. But I would, I'm trying to make the point: mm. you're buying for capital growth, mm. you're buying for leverage to those commodity prices recovering. Yeah. Don't buy them for income. Okay, Paul. Look, I agree, I agree with the comment. I, mean, I think stick to the BHP, maybe Rio, but I I, I like the, um, the 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 diversity of the, the, the mineral base. I think that's the way yeah. to play resource companies. I think um, look, as I said, the oil price. I'm a little more optimistic on the oil price because OPEC's done a remarkable job, or OPEC plus the non-OPEC yeah. nations, of holding it above fifty dollars. It's dipped below fifty dollars uh, in this last week, and let's just see what they do on the, the production side. The problem we've got in so, Australia with oil yeah. stocks in Australia specifically is their gas stocks, mm. their LNG stocks, and the LNG spot price has collapsed. There is a global oversupply of liquefied natural gas, so. If you're going to buy an oil stock, you might, you know, you're actually probably better off with BHP because you actually get oil rather than gas mm. in terms of that. So just be a little bit careful, I'd say, in the LNG stocks. That's still well oversupplied. Okay. And there's force majeure in contracts. It's a bit messy. Though. Okay. I, I want one stock from both of you that you think looks fantastic at this point in time, Paul. You can say CSL if you want to. Look, I still think CSL at the right price. So mm. um, I put mark that down on your, on your buy list. Mm. Um, I actually think I'm going to be a bit defensive, and I actually think there's a uh, one stock I just I like stocks that are pretty well just generate income, don't have too much downside risk, mm -hmm. can go up a little bit. This stock was overvalued. I think many banks now in the category of, of it's got uh, it's 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 near right. rearing bottom. I can't quite work out how, how whether health insurance is going to be impacted by coronavirus. I don't think it is no. necessarily. So uh, if anything, they might close some hospitals down, private hospitals. But anyhow, we'll see how that plays out. So uh, look, it, it's not it's not a huge, huge capital gain, but I think it's uh, it's on top of a its steady game. stock. At the it's price. a steady stock. It's actually going customers. And I, despite all the, the headwinds of that industry, and there are lots of headwinds in health insurance, um, it's actually going its customer base. So Charlie, I'm going to go for that. Well, I'm going to go for a global one because I do yeah. global, yeah. and I, it's actually Apple. I think Apple, yeah. at, Apple at around $260, $270. What's this high been? $320, $330. Yeah. It's pulled back about 15%. Supply chain now recovering. Fortress balance sheet, $200 billion of cash on the balance sheet, doing an active buyback program. 5G phones coming up later this year. I think it's a good way of playing. It's a good way of hedging yourself. Mm. Yeah, you're buying a, a very ultra high quality company with great, great balance sheet at a lower price. But if the recovery comes, it's well leveraged to it. Mm. So look, that's that's where I put some money to work, and I think that looks like a good good place to hide. Okay, so the summary gets down to it's fiscal policy and monetary policy versus the possible escalation or de-escalation of the infection well, associated we're, we're, with we're coronavirus. In a, well, we've been in a one-way street last week, which was just coronavirus. Yeah. Now we've got central banks turning up. They turned up on Friday with Jay Powell. Yeah. And now it gets interesting. I think you're going to see volatility, Pete. Yeah. A sort of bottoming process, a few up nights, a few down nights, whatever. Yeah, we, yeah. And we, yeah. Have, we haven't had any bottoming at all. No, we've, we've, no. Had, we've had six or seven down nights in a row, right? Yeah. So a bit yeah. of this stuff. It's been nosebleed stuff. A bit of this bit. stuff, you know, central banks, a bit of hope, coronavirus, a bit yeah. of fear, hope, fear, hope, fear. Yeah. And let's hope hope wins. Okay. Well, let's back and hope. Then, and if hope wins, with the greed, hope and fear, Peter, we know about that. So <laughs> right. you've got to balance those two off. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll back hope. And if they're wrong, we'll call them no hopers. Thanks very much, guys. Charlie Aitken, Aitken Investment Management, and Paul Rickard, Switzer Report.
Well, we know when it becomes scary times for economies, there's only one person I ever go to, and that's Steve Keen. Professor Steve Keen, good to see you, mate. Good to be back, mate. All right, yeah. so last time we spoke, we were worried about house prices mm -hmm. and the economic implications and, and whatever. And uh, we got over that at least temporarily. Yeah, yeah. Um, and along comes a new curveball in the coronavirus. Total curveball, yeah. Okay. Now, I want to concentrate with you purely on two, th two things. How the coronavirus will affect economies. Yep. Mm. And then the stock market, because yep. this is our, our investing show. Yeah. So kick us off. What are you seeing in your... More negative crystal ball than <laughs> mine. Well, I'm, I'm, because I'm not an expert on the medical side, no. so I'm following people. Oh, you, but you sound like you've put a lot of work into understanding. I have, yeah, because yeah. I always want to know what's going on. Yeah. There. So there's yeah. a guy called Chris Martinson. I recommend people to take a look at. He has a big blog called Peak Prosperity Blog, mm. and Chris actually, I've forgotten which area of medicine he has a PhD in, but he mm. has in that. He talks on finance. Yeah. And he's, a, you know, he's got sort of my perspective, as you can imagine. Very sane guy. Yeah, but you hang around with me. I, I don't That's have true. exactly yeah, the same. We, we, we're good you, mates. I, I would think you're a, a more Renaissance person, can tolerate people who disagree. That's right. I can, I can hold ideas that I don't necessarily agree with. Exactly. Okay. But anyway, Chris, Chris has got a medical background. And so when he saw this thing coming, mm. he said the dangerous thing about, well, several dangerous things. The first dangerous thing is you can transmit it when you're asymptomatic. Mm. What's that mean? Asymptomatic? It means you don't have any signs. Okay. You, don't, you don't know you're sick. Okay. The person sitting next to you doesn't know you're sick, yeah. but you're sick. And what you're doing is pumping out uh, virus particles. Okay. Okay? So that's the first danger. Yeah. Uh, the second danger is it's, it's very, got a very high transmissibility rate. So there's a number that medical people call the R0. Mm. And what that tells you is how many people are likely to be infected by somebody who's got it. Yep. And the flu, for example, is about an R0 of... 1.1 or 3 or 1.3, that mm. sort of range, okay. which means one person gets between 1.13 and 1.3 people will get the flu. Okay, but we've already got immunity to mm. that, yep. and that means that you know of those people who get it, a lot of them already have antibodies which can fight it. Yep. Now this thing has an R zero of a guessing between two and four. Okay, okay, it began at about four, so that means every person who gets it <coughs> passes on to four other people, and it we don't have any immunity to it. Mm. It's a it's a new virus. Uh, it's part of the family of viruses which the common cold is part mm. of. And for a large number of people, it'll just be the sniffles. Yeah. You might even know you've got it, that mm. sort of thing. But for a minority that it affects, then they get a very severe dose of it. Mm. And what's turning up is that uh, the, the death rate is running at about one... The guesses that we're trying to estimate, because it's brand new, between 1% and 2%. Of, of those who get a severe... Yeah. OK, OK. Uh, now, it... it well, it's actually running higher those who get a severe dose, okay? Mm. But over the whole population, maybe 1% to 2% is the guess. Now, the mm. flu is 0.1 to 0.2%. Okay. So it's 10 times, 10, as times. Virulent, okay. 10 times as virulent and two or three times as transmissible. Mm. And we have no herd immunity to it, mm. which pretty much means unless we do something as draconian as the Chinese, where they've been shutting the whole cities down, mm. literally, have you seen some videos on yeah. YouTube, mm. welding up mm. apartment right. uh, exit doors, uh, that will stop it because the virus can't live outside the body for very long. Mm. Okay. So if you just say no, nobody else is going to get it, mm. um, no contact allowed, you'll kill it, it will yeah. just die out. So, so basically for, for world economies, we're talking about no people turning up the football games? Exactly. Nobody going to restaurants. Yeah. Um, Nobody uh, going to lectures. It just closes down the hospitality industry in particular. But yeah. then you've got factories, you can't, yeah. you can't do it. So it, it could mean if, if the world could do as it's told, mm. um, basically losing two months' worth of GDP worldwide. More, if, if you did, oh, a lot more. Yeah, but if you close it down. Oh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you said, if you said, okay, for two, like, we, we for said two months, no one goes go, to work, go shopping, no one goes to school. Buy, buy enough food for, right. a, uh, for right. a month back right. at home. Don't go out, right. you know. That's not going to happen. Put up, you know, that's, it's certainly not in the West. Okay. okay. Now, Steve, you've always been good at doing the numbers on the worst case scenario, mm, mm. which I then will say at the very end of the end, I hope you're wrong. Yeah. You say, yeah. I hope I am as well. Mm. What are the worst case numbers? For well, the illness, and then we'll work out the economic okay. implications. Worst case numbers would be that 70% of the population get it, yeah. and that 1% to 2% of them die. Okay. Okay. Right. So if you're looking at a global population of about 7 billion, that's about 5 billion cases, 50 million to 100 million deaths. Mm -hmm. It's on the scale of the Spanish flu back in the end of the, end of the First World War. That's the worst case That's scenario. the worst case scenario, yeah. yeah. The best case scenario at the other extreme is China, 
ironically, may be the best place to go in a few months' time mm. because their total lockdown will mean it disappears. Mm. And rather than people being prevented for going to China because they might get the disease, China might say, you're not coming in because you might have the disease. Okay. What do you think is going to be the economic implication for pretty global huge, GDP? Pretty huge. Actually, that might be one reason to bring up that uh, the chart that's on the screen right now to talk about it because yeah. A large, a large problem we had with financial fragility mm. at the same time mm. as having a huge systemic crisis like this. Mm. So you have a huge number of people, of course, these days, you know, the gig economy. Mm. Well, that sounds really good, but most people in the gig economy, one or two weeks loss of income and they can't pay the rent. Mm. Uh, mm. Even people with uh, full-time jobs, a month or two months, uh, no salary, they can't yeah. pay the mortgage. Yeah. Uh, so banks would have to give them a holiday, therefore banks' profits will fall and share prices will fall yeah. and indexes would go with it because yeah. banks drive indexes. And we've already Australia. seen, well, the S&P is down 14% so yeah. far. Mm. So it's the biggest, it probably actually, I think it's almost, it's not quite the same scale as 2008, 7, 2008, no. but it's close. Yeah. Okay. Well, the GFC, after Lehman Brothers failed, mm. down 57%. That was, yeah. that was huge. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the, the 87, we're talking around 25, 27%. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this, this could be big. It and could be big. My, my, this is, if, you, if you look at banks have to have positive equity. Mm. Okay, so if bank assets collapse in value where the liabilities remain constant, bang, they're mm. bankrupt. So we can have a, a financial crisis on a grand scale if we let that happen. Mm. So one thing I've been arguing for for a long time is a, is a remedy for what actually caused the GFC, which is too much private debt, too much credit, which is new debt, which is what we, we yeah. use credit to buy with, and that's part of aggregate demand, which mainstream economists refuse to accept, mm. but, but it's true. Um, the, I've said we should have a, a modern debt jubilee, and the idea there would be to use the, the central bank's capacity to create money, to inject money into everybody's bank accounts. Those that are in debt can pay it down, those that don't have debt get a cash injection, et cetera, et cetera. And I've been seeing that as a remedy for the financial situation we're in. But this time round, we need it in case people go bankrupt just because their cash flow co collapses. Mm. Okay, so I would like to see what, exactly what Hong Kong has done. Hong Kong has already done this, and not so how they've distributed it. But every person in Hong Kong who's eligible, and it's like it's most of the population, has been given ten thousand Hong Kong dollars, which is about two thousand dollars Australian. Mm. Now, if you think about that as a as a, a buffer saying, well, okay, you, you... It's like you, the Wayne Swan <coughs> checks. It's exactly, GFC. exactly, exactly. It went, went to... Uh, Harvey, Harvey Norman, Norman and overseas and, to uh, China. And the Panthers as well for yeah. poke machines. And so unfortunately. Mm. But yeah, but this, if you, we really need to give, to use the state's capacity to create money right now to get us through this. Mm. So I'm arguing for, I call it modern, modern debt jubilee, but maybe, maybe a coronavirus jubilee. Yeah. But, but it's, it's a Keynesian solution really, isn't it? Well, it's, it's just realisation that there's two ways to make money. Banks can create it by lending, by loans. Yeah. The government create it by either running a deficit in the, mm. the treasury or the yeah. central bank discrediting your account. Wouldn't more conventional economists say, well, if we cut interest rates, Effectively, it is cheaper for people to service their debt. Oh, mate, as long on. as they don't lose their job. <laughs> if the rates were 20 and 30 percent, that might make a difference. Yeah. They're, they're two and three yeah. percent. And the thing is, you, you, if you. But they're going to do that, Steve. You know, you know, oh, they'll go to zero. They're, they're, they're going to do that. But we're, we're Australia's already, what, 0.75? Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. how yeah. far can they yeah, cut? Sure. Yeah. Interest rates are not an effective yeah. tool. No. Okay. But, but the next yeah. thing they'll do, obviously, will be just like you said, the Treasurer will have to probably cut <coughs> taxes and do spending. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but, I think, but I think the best method in terms of immediate, because this is so immediate, mm. uh, if, if, if people suddenly are not going to restaurants anymore, that restaurant owner is going bankrupt right. for no fault of their yeah. own. And yeah. that's where your jubilee, I can't yeah. use jubilee, you spent too much time in England, it's, it's too English a term. But I've dreamt it up over here, mate. So oh, yeah, okay. It actually goes back to the ancient Sumerians. <laughs> okay. The jubilee is actually biblical, so yeah. if you can see me with a biblical hat on. And it's, it's rare that you would agree with Ken Henry, but it's exactly what Ken Henry told Wayne Swan. You're going to have to put go money hard, straight. Go early, go that's part of the reason why we avoided yeah. the recession. Well, Ken Henry, funnily enough, he's the brother of the guy who taught me differential equations at New South Wales University. Oh, well, there you go. Bruce Henry. And uh, on that particular point, I completely agree with him. I think he got completely stuffed up when he got into the banking sector. <laughs> okay. He had no <laughs> idea what he's getting into, okay. but he was right about the GFC. All right, okay. So let's stick to the big picture yeah. then. Your view then is the global economy cannot escape a substantial recession? Not this time around. Yeah. This, this is, you would call it an exogenous shock, yeah. okay, except that the reason it's happening is the same reason climate change is happening. Mm. As a species, we're putting too much pressure on the environment. Mm. We make up, humans make up about 90% 
Humans and animals are humans breed, mm. make up about 90% of the animal mass of the planet. What's the most sensible place for a pathogen to develop? Mm. Okay, mm. and who's the most mobile species on the planet, mm. et cetera, et cetera. We're set, we've set ourselves up for this. Yeah. So it's not really exogenous, but mm. in the classic economic sense, from the outside of the economy, right. this is the biggest exogenous shock mm. since a world war. But, but you know, your biggest problem is that you think at a high level, people at the lower level will be saying, why don't we just stop Chinese people eating um, raw snake, whether a bat. I think that's part of it too. I mean, I'm, I'm totally in favour of that. I've been yeah. to some of these markets. Have yeah. you been to them as well? Yeah, I have. Okay. They worried me Oh, too. they're weird. You know, yeah. The last thing you want to do is enable cross species. So as the Chinese have said, we're shutting them down. Yeah. And I'm 100% in favour of that. They should not exist. Yeah. And people make their living out of that, go work in a factory instead. Yeah. yeah. And in many ways, China has become such an important part of the global economy. This is the big, yeah. They have to play ball by the standards that the rest of the world Yeah, plays and that's by. part of it. But also, of course, because they're so much part of the supply chain, yeah. we're going to see physical shortages coming out now because uh, you, I don't know how long it takes for a container vessel to go from you know, Shanghai to San Francisco, but mm. it's of the order of a couple of weeks. Mm. Now, at some point, the, the naval, you know, the seamen are going to be saying, no, mm. not going on board that thing. And you know, the owners will do the same thing, so the shipping will stop. Yeah. So the whole, the reliance of the, of the supply chain of physical supply from China will mean it hits manufacturing throughout the world. Okay. Now, the one thing I, I'd say is very different from the GFC was, mm. Um, and you remember this, central banks were often very reactive. Ever since the GFC, mm. they've been very proactive. Mm. Yeah, well, well, you, not knowing what and, they're doing, and, but, but yeah, yeah. yeah, like what they've, they've done. Mm. But you know, like even like Lehman Brothers, they waited for Lehman Brothers to fail, and mm. all of a sudden they said, well, we better, we better support the car company, we better support the banks, mm. and we better throw money at the problem. Mm. Well, they're in there doing it. That, in a sense, could reduce the amount of stock market falling. It could. Because yeah. both, if governments respond the way you say, mm. put money in there, and reserve banks will do it, cut interest rates, which they'll do, but they'll yeah. do it anyway, yeah. it will probably mean that if this was set to be another 57% fall, it might end up being 20 Yeah, well, the, the central banks of, with QE mm. have been buying bonds mm. of any description pretty mm. much off the financial sector. Mm. Uh, in Japan, they've been buying shares as well. Mm. So you quite possibly have, because they, uh, the, the central bank has a limitless capability to buy assets. They can yeah. say, here's a billion dollars in your bank account, mm. and we are buying that billion dollars worth of assets, so our assets rise and our liabilities mm. rise. And unlike a normal bank, they don't have to maintain positive equity. Yeah. They can do whatever they like on yeah. that front. So they could actually rescue the whole, they could actually end up owning most of the stock market because when you think about the hum human reaction, panic can get out. Yeah. It's already down, as you said, 14% over what uh, since Valentine's oh, Day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when they dive in, they can end up buying half the share market. Yeah. It's a bit like Super Mario's whatever it takes. Yeah. But so this, this needs a whatever it takes response. Mm. And uh, you know, we, what we really need, and this is in, in the terms of the innovation side, we should have firms just being paid mm. to come up with new attempts at you know, viral, antivirals, antibacterials. Don't care about making money, fund them with government money, as many as you can. You know, quality assurance in terms of got decent scientists and so they generally care about what they're doing. We need to have defences for this done very rapidly. Ah. It will still take six months to a year before there's a vaccine. Mm and a couple of years before there's an antiviral and in the meantime we could lose a large part of the over 70 population. Yeah, especially the, the, uh, from what I can see males and smokers are very vulnerable. Yeah and, and, and over, over 70 as well which is getting worrying for you and me. Yeah <laughs> not quite there yet but we're getting there. I know. Hey uh, well one, one last thing as all mm. interviews finish hope you're wrong. As always so do I. That's Steve Keane. From, I don't know where nowadays, but uh, Debunking Economics is the great book that puts Steve on the map. Well, that's Steve Keane's point of view on the subject. Let's just see if Chris Joy differs with him markedly. Historically, they have, but do they disagree on this one? Joining me now is Chris Joy, a guy who watches markets very, very closely. Great to see you, Chris. Uh, good to be on the show again, Peter. Now, how worried are you about the coronavirus and the market implications? <clears throat> um, I mean, we're all exercised. Um, I think it also brings with it opportunities. In the month of February, we saw Aussie shares down uh, 8 to 9 percent, but bond prices actually rallied. Uh, so we run something called um, the Active Composite Bond Strategy, and that was actually up 
0.8% in February because yields fell um, on the basis of that search for <clears throat> security and safety in government bonds. Um, so I think there are opportunities. We've definitely seen some very, very large dislocations uh, right across the markets. Um, in my domain credit, it's quite bifurcated. <clears throat> in the high yield bond market, we've seen explosive increases in spreads um, and really poor performance from junk bond funds. Um, you're already seeing on the ASX um, those high yield listed investment trusts um, today, some are trading at 13 to 15% below their net tangible assets. Um, so big drawdowns uh, in that space. Um, but uh, in the high grade market, we've seen relative stability, um, only relatively modest movements in spreads. And in government bonds, <coughs> we've seen yields um, drop. Now, what that means is, mate, um, on Friday, the Aussie market was pricing in a 15% chance that the RBA cut rates on uh, Tuesday, tomorrow, now the market is pricing in <clears throat> basically more than a 100% chance. They're actually pricing in the possibility of more than one rate cut, so 50 basis points. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the coronavirus itself, we've always argued that it wasn't sure whether the Chinese were containing and we needed to look at South Korea and Italy. About midway through last week, <clears throat> we formed the view that there was no containment evident in um, those two countries. And so we wanted to put on some hedges and we are already seeing signs of further outbreaks um, in countries like the US and uh, obviously what appears to be <clears throat> a global pandemic. I think um, the key mate is um, that there are critical decision making nodes for investors. The first is when do we get a vaccine? The Americans are saying 12 months, the Israelis are saying 120 days, um, I think the, the, the Chinese could surprise. I think we might see <clears throat> an early vaccine in the next four to six months from the Chinese. A second factor is, when do we get an antiviral drug to fight the coronavirus? Gilead Sciences uh, drug is being tested by the Chinese and they uh, will complete human trials in late April. So it's possible that in the next few months we'll have a decent drug available. In the meantime, markets are air gapping. <clears throat> There are huge air pockets in markets and we need central banks to act very aggressively. And that's certainly when we're talking to central banks and governments, Peter, we have definitely advised them last year, uh, sorry, last week, that they need to move uh, quickly and assertively. If we get coordinated cuts from the Fed and the RBA and the ECB, I think <clears throat> we may see markets find a temporary bottom. The problem is we're gonna have negative news flow for the next uh, six to nine months economic news flow and earnings news flow. Okay, now given that, does it, you, are you also advocating that the budget, the fiscal response has to be pretty strong as well? Yeah, I think so. I think that the, my sense is that the government is not attached to the surplus target anymore. This is a, the problem for markets right now is they've never had to price a pandemic. You know, it's one thing to price the probabilities around trade wars, North Korea, Brexit, Grexit, but how do you price a global virus um, that's killing people and that is shutting down economies? Um, I think that we'll see a, um, a calibrated and proportional stimulus from the government. So I think, uh, you know, ScoMo has already announced that um, he will be delivering a stimulus <coughs> package, and I would expect to see more detail on that um, very shortly. But I think that if we get around a central bank cuts and QE and fiscal stimulus, um, that has a very good shot of placating markets. Um, but we are going to need to see quite uh, aggressive liquidity injections. One of the things we've done, mate, I have um, <clears throat> uh, 23 staff, 11 analysts, uh, five portfolio managers and four PhDs. And I have a data science team that have built real time trackers of the infection rates and the mortality rates around the world. Um, that are updated every 15 minutes <clears throat> and what i'm actually looking at those right now and the current um the current uh, fatality rate in korea is let me just pull this up buddy <clears throat> the current fatality rate in korea is right now running at 0.5 percent so everyone's talked about the 2.6 percent fatality rate in china 
But if we look at China X Hubei, um, we are running at a fatality rate of 0.8%. And the, we, we, the problem with the data on the fatality rates, Peter, has been we know the number of deaths. We have likely been underestimating the number of infections. <clears throat> and we don't have any, obviously, antiviral drugs yet. So I think when we start testing more accurately, and I think the Koreans have been very good on the testing, so we've got good infection data from the Koreans, um, I think you'll see globally that fatality rate fall from the 2.5% rate that people have quoted for China, including Hebei, <clears throat> right back down to about 0.5% or less. I think actually we'll fall well below 0.5% closer to, I mean, the flu is sort of running at about 0.1%. Yeah. So I think if, if the world can get comfortable that the fatality rate's actually only about 0.5%, then I think you may see people shift to a mitigation strategy rather than a containment strategy. So rather than shutting down your economy, <clears throat> like the Chinese initially did, I think people will start emulating what the Chinese are now doing, which is mitigation. I actually don't think the Chinese are trying to contain I think the Chinese have said, listen, you know, outside of, as I said, outside of Hubei, the fatality rate's only 0.8%. And for the working age population, it's probably about 0.2. And I think that's a risk President Xi's happy to run. <clears throat> and when you get drugs in a few months and then a vaccine, I think the broader impacts will be mitigated. So uh, I think there are buying, I'm actually really excited about the buying opportunities. I'm not convinced they're here and now, uh, right now. Um, I mean, we have tentatively last week uh, nibbled at some opportunities, but we have a huge amount of spare ammo uh, and dry powder. And I'm really waiting for the central banks to intervene. They need to assuage markets because what we're seeing <clears throat> is what I call market failure. Equity markets and bond markets are the corporate bond market for new issuances closed globally. So if you're a company and you've got a, a debt that's outstanding that you want to replace and refinance by issuing a bond, you cannot do that right now. So why? <clears throat> because the market's shut. No one will buy anything. And the problem, the reason people won't buy anything is because people can't price the probabilities of a pathogenic okay. pandemic. It's not like you and I saying, will you know, Trump and Xi agree a deal or won't they? You know, we're trying to price you know, shutting down the Chinese economy, shutting down the Italian economy potentially shutting down the American economy. So listen, I'm probably in the more optimistic camp that this becomes more like a um, nasty seasonal flu and uh, we get more accustomed uh, to the vagaries of the drug. Even the reproduction rate, <clears throat> the so-called R0, is at 2.3 based on um, a range of different estimates. And the influenza runs at a reproduction rate of one and a half to two and a half um, so it's sort of in the, the flu range, and I think the R0 will come down because what we're now seeing is changing human behaviours. People aren't shaking hands, they aren't kissing each other on the cheeks. People are much more conscious of uh, transmission risks, and I think that will help reduce the R0 below two. Okay, let me, ask, let me ask some important questions for our viewers. Do you think the stock market will go into a bear market because of this? 20% down? and stay down for a long time, or you, it could be a 20% down and a rebound? Mate, you know I am notorious for having high conviction views where I do express strong opinions. Yeah. It's hard for me to express a strong opinion only because I have two views on equities. On the one hand, I think equity beta, <clears throat> which is basically the market, um, will respond quite favorably to the central bank interventions. Yeah. I so I think the central banks can absolutely cauterize um, the current free fall in equities. And right now, I mean, U.S. equity futures uh, in their <coughs> overnight session, they're up strongly right now, 0.8%, uh, which is pretty interesting. Mm. And our market has turned around from its earlier negativity, but go on. Yeah, that's right. So, um, but on the other hand, um, I think that... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, but on the other hand, um, you know, we've seen this pattern where the U.S. equity futures market rallies in the Asian session and then gets pummeled in the European and um, and U.S. sessions. I think the problem here is the risk that um, we are going to get six to nine months of negative news flow on economic data. So we're going to get very negative economic data. And for equities, I think we'll see <clears throat> six to nine months of e equity earnings downgrades. 
Yeah. And um, probably six to 12 months of earnings downgrades. And I think that um, you're going to see subsectors of the equity market pummel airlines, tourism companies, you know, the luxury uh, goods and services providers. Um, so I think that it's going to be very heterogeneous. But I think overall, equity beta um, should be okay. Whether there's a bottom right now, I'm not sure. I think the central banks, if they want to engineer a bottom, um, that's well within well within their capacity. But we're likely okay. to see more outbreaks. We're likely to see um, more bad news on the coronavirus yeah. uh, juxtaposed against a lot of positive news in yeah. terms of central bank and fiscal policy stimulus. That's uh, the other thing that's different here. We are going to get coordinated fiscal and monetary stimulus. Yeah. Now, this next question. Do you think the Aussie economy goes into a recession? Six months of negative growth. And, and be right, please. I definitely think we get a negative quarter of GDP growth. Um, I think it's a line ball call as to whether we get two negative quarters of GDP growth. Yeah. Um, I, I think it, it's a 50-50 call. Um, I think that uh, it's entirely possible we get a technical negative, uh, a, a technical recession with two consecutive negative quarters of GDP growth. Okay, mate. Well, as always, thanks for joining us. And that's the show for tonight. You have to hope that the combined power of monetary policy and fiscal policy can do what Charlie and Paul says is possible. And I guess you might be surprised that both Chris and uh, Steve Keane kind of agree on that particular subject. And finally, let me invite you to our Strategy Day in Sydney on March the 17th in Melbourne, March 24, and Brisbane, March 25. We're gonna have some of the smartest guys in this country talking about how they're investing, and the coronavirus will clearly be a very important subject. Thanks for joining us.